Hello and welcome back to the Student Hub Live Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Showcase. In this next session, we take a look at A225, The British Isles and the Modern World, 1789 to 1914. And I am joined by Anna Plassart and Donna Loftus. Thank you for coming along. Now, this is the longest title, I think, and one that's very dated. Is there a significance to this? And was it difficult to think of the exact wording for this module? Do you want to start? The short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> only have 20 minutes. Do you want to collaborate on the, okay, on the so, British Isles, maybe? OK, so, me. yeah, well, it's the long 19th... Sorry, I'm starting with the long 19th century. It starts with the French Revolution, it ends with the First World War, and in that, uh, the British Isles in that period changes a lot. So there's the relationship between England, Ireland, Wales and Scotland, and also the relationship with the wider world. So, yeah, the title is an attempt to encompass all of those things. Excellent. Now, this is a level two module, so we're getting to some extent um, specific, but also, again, very broad. And you cover a lot in this module, both in terms of time and also content and skills. Absolutely. Yeah. No, so it's a step up from level one and it will go deeper into some of the, uh, the methods of history on tr um, how you are a historian. And it will kind of, um, well, it will be a refresher for those that have done uh, another level two history course and an introduction for those that are new to history as well. Now, you mentioned the modern world, Donna. Anna, I wonder if you can talk a bit about how that applies to scope, because we've mentioned the sort of time factors, which are obvious there. But, but scope is another way of looking at the modern world. Yes, that's right. Um, we wanted to include the modern world because obviously every period thinks that they are modern because that's their modernity but there's something special about the 19th century and one of these special things I think is that it's the first time in history in British history anyway that people living in the times start to think of themselves as being living in a modern globalized world and that's quite new so that's what we wanted to uh, get through with this, with this title and part of being globalised is, as Donna was saying earlier, is having all these relationships with the wider world and we really try to include that in the module because it is what makes British history in a period. It's all the relationships with Europe, all the wars, well, two big wars, beginning and end, uh, Ireland as well, British Isles Island, and also um, the British Empire. So it's all these things coming together to make Britain a global place in the 19th century for the first time when people are really realising realizing this and thinking, oh, we are modern. So that's what we wanted to... Um... But the focus is very much on Britain, but it's not an inward history of Britain. It's a, yeah. it's a history of Britain in the context of the wider world. And it's about, you know, um, the modern is so, so much associated with these sort of narratives of progress. And we want to show that actually that modernity can shift in different ways. There's progress in some areas. There's defence of tradition in, in others. And there's this push-pull um, in different directions, and which produces lots of contradictions, great wealth, great poverty, great confidence, great anxiety, and a sort of national identity, and one that's also very fractured by ideas of class and region. This term, dialectic of modernity, and you're talking about the push-pull and all the exciting things that are happening. So we've got these geographical changes and also these sort of changes in terms of access to things as a result of industrialization you know, all of a sudden there's access to the printing press and news. and Such a massive amount of sources are both generated at this time that I guess historians can use, um, which I know is one of the key things that, that you look at in terms of skills throughout the module. But, but there, is a, there is an awful lot there. So just sort of tell me then about this dialectic of modernity and the push-pull and how you explore that throughout these sort of blocks of the module. Well, I mean, one of the things about doing 19th century history is you have to cope with a proliferation of a range of different kinds of sources, um, government inquiries, newspapers, um, images, and um, and and these are these are produced sort of the, in lots of different re regions for lots of different reasons, and so you can kind of get so many different perspectives on the 19th century. And coping with that diversity and that proliferation is very very difficult, and I think. One of the things we have to do in this course is give the students the skills for managing that, that diversity and that range. And um, the dialectic, in a way, comes from seeing them in conversation or seeing them in relationship to each other. So one source might produce this particular image of modernity and progress and of uh, a government getting, on, getting um, in control of change. And then others will produce a kind of very different impression of resistance and 
Um, I suppose also the way different identities are produced by different kinds of events and experiences. So let's talk a lot, take a look at the, the blocks because you have a three block structure and um, it's books and online materials as well. Um, so Anna, could you talk us through block one, which is about ambition and anxiety, um, 1789 to 1840? Yep, uh, I can. Um, well, the block is really about <clears throat> all the new things transforming Britain in the early 19th century. And there are a range of different factors that make it so Britain really is transformed between 1789 and 1840. The most obvious one, I would say, is probably our starting point, which is 1789. That's the French Revolution, which actually is a huge event in British history for a number of reasons. The first one is probably political. It infuses British politics with all sorts of new radical ideas. Uh, but also, the French Revolution comes with wars. And, the, and Britain is at war from 1793 to 1815 with barely a stop. That's 22 years of almost continuous war that completely transforms Britain as well. And another change is the economic change of industrialization. So it's a period when there starts being a mass exodus from uh, rural areas towards cities. Uh, and people start working in cities, start working in factories. It's the beginnings of, of the factory system. So it's this brand new economic system that's starting to take hold in Britain and transforms its landscape, transforms the way people work. And one of the things we talk about in this block is the birth and the rise of something called the working class that didn't really exist before, but that's really that really comes from all these new changes put together and they interact in, in a number of different ways. This working class that is starting to rise due to all the economic changes also finds a political identity in part thanks to the French Revolution starting, starts, to find a, starts to find a political voice demanding changing, demanding political changing for, for representation. So it's all really intertwined and the block is about how British people experienced these changes and how they tried to make sense of them. What is this new Britain? And it's a really difficult thing to come to grips with when everything is changing around you. So it's, it's really change, I think, would be the key word in, in this first block. And it leaves us in, in 1840 with a Britain that's quite industrialized and with a clear um, working class demanding political rights, which is quite new. And also it leaves, it leaves Britain with a, the beginnings of what is going to become the British Empire. So Britain had, all, had long had st strong trade links in the, in the Atlantic world between the Americas and Africa, but in the period it also starts developing its empire in the East. And that will come through in block two. Donna, how do self-help books, recipe books, come into block two then, which is about <laughs> confidence and crisis? <laughs> well, of course, we, we finished block one um, with a, a society which is, you know, suffering, or it suffered a lot of change, it's great uncertainty, and we, we start 1840 with the threat of revolution, the rise of chartism, but very soon this dissipates, and what we seem to enter a period of relative confidence and stability, a period which is known as the age of equipoise. And... Um, in the block, we explore the reasons for that. And one of them is to do with the rise of the middle class. And Mrs. Beaton is there to demonstrate how the rise of this new class um, creates a demand, really, for, for new ways of living and new guidance on how to live. So Mrs. Beaton's book is it meets that market, this sort of anxious middle class not knowing quite how to live in the new urban city. Um, and then we have Samuel Smiles, who is, um, I mean, he dominates the age. His, his book is published in 1859, the same year as Darwin's Origin of Species, and it's a massive be bestseller. And it's all about the gospel of work and thrift and perseverance and industry. But it's about how um, individual energy is going to regenerate society. And, you know, through transforming yourself, you can transform the world around you. And that inspires great confidence in the, in, in the mid-19th century to the extent that um, social problems still exist. There's still great poverty. The Irish famine, the legacy of the Irish famine lingers for many, many years. But nevertheless, there is this confidence that we can resolve society's problems. And then block three, um, Anna, is about uh, decline and renewal. 
So talk us through that. Yes, well, the counterpoint to confidence is um, the fear of decline. And that starts very much appearing in this later period, which is quite par paradoxical because in one way, it's very much the period of, it's the peak of British power, of the British empire. It's, it's Britain is very wealthy. It has no doubt of its place in the world. At the same time, this fear of decline, of, of decline is instilled in British society. And you have all these conversations about, well, we have peaked, you know, there's, there's nowhere to go but down. And this is the anxiety side of it. Um, but it's a complex period because at, at the same time, it's also a, a very modern period in the sense that people are very aware of living in, a, in an innovative, modern world. And well, one way to think about it is to, 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 to think of the working class, I think. Again, the working class. I wrote on the working class, so. <laughs> um, if you look at newspaper reports, if you look at what the middle classes are writing about the, the working class, it's very fear-inducing. There's this fear that the, the genetic stock of the nation is declining, basically. But if you look at what working class people are writing about themselves, if you look at the unions, um, if you look at the associations, there's a real sense of confidence in themselves and of political organization. And also it's the moment when this, this work, working class culture started, started to inform into mass popular culture. So they really drive the rise of cinema, the rise of the music hall, the rise of associated with sports like football. So all of this is really coming to the fore in the period at the same time as middle class observers are saying, oh, this is not going well at all. So it's this, it's this push and pull, you know, this paradox. So, so Donna, do you just learn all of this history? I mean, it's, it's a 30-week it's a module and it seems like there's an awful lot to cover. Um, how, how do you teach people how to be a historian in addition to the history? Well, to answer your, the first part of your question, no, you can't possibly know all of this yourself and learn all of it yourself. And so historians learn in dialogue with each other. They learn from each other. They read each other's work. They study each other's sources. They even share sources between them. And we hope in this course to get students involved in that kind of learning. And and um, there are two collaborative assignments, TMAO3 and TMAO5, where we um, attempt to draw students into that kind of discussion and debate and collaborative learning. Each student will have a source, their own source, and a question, and they will be asked to kind of post responses to the, the question and the source in a forum and then to share those ideas. They then take those ideas and answer an essay question themselves. And the point is to show that you can't know everything. You can't cover all the sources, particularly for the 19th century, but you can share them and you can learn from each other. So let's go on to the assessment now as we end up um, with, with, uh, with this aspect, because what I really like about the way you've done this is that you've got the collaboration, but there's an individual mark. And I think that that can be really important to students. So they're benefiting from that exercise. But again, it's all assessed individually. And you've mentioned that this applies to two of the TMAs, but there are five in total. Yeah, there are five. Do you want to talk about the other ones? Um, yeah, just, just to, 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 to go back on, on what Donna was saying, I think it, um, the collaborative work is meant to replicate the way historians work together. So we talk together, we exchange ideas, we learn from each other, but in the end, we write our own work, and that's what's assessed. So it, it's meant to, for students to work like historians, yeah. very much so. And the other TMAs are, I would say, much more classical TMAs. That it, it's, um, the first one is source-based, so it's discussing a source and what we can learn from it, discussing an, an, an extract from an autobiography. Um, so it's again very much honing the skills of being a historian. And TMAs two, four, and six are essays. So a question that you answer in, a, in an essay, so much more. And normal. then there's a three hour exam with three questions at the end. That's right, yeah, and there'd be plenty of support for that. Excellent. You've given us a really wonderful overview of the module. It sounds really exciting. It sounds jam-packed with lots of both skills um, as well as content. And, and the way that it's structured, um, you could see that students wouldn't get bored with that. So, so Donna and Anna, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to show you a couple of short videos from our 60 Second Adventures series. And these are going to be 60 Second Adventures in Thought. And then we're going to end the last of our session today with a... Sorry, A853, which is the MA in Philosophy Part 1. I will see you in a few minutes.